Welcome to this virtual service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Waynesboro. We come together as a caring community in many ways, calling each other on the phone, emailing, meeting casually but socially distanced in the park around the bandstand, leaving each other meals on the doorstep when we are needing a little extra help, sharing in the caring work of our community by participating, for example, in the Verona Food Pantry with all appropriate precautions, and by coming together for virtual coffee hours using the Zoom meeting platform to see each other's faces and hear each other's voices, even when our level of reasonable precaution keeps us apart. This sir virtual service aims to fill in for some of the functions of our Sunday morning service but we realize it is one piece of many in maintaining our connections and our sense of community. Welcome to this service. I'm Sylvia Woodworth, and I'm team leader of the Carry Network. We are always ready when need arises to help by perhaps bringing a meal or giving you a ride to a medical appointment, uh, running errands, or just offering some cheerful encouragement. Now, Edwin Markham, who lived from 1852 to 1940, was sometimes called the Universalist Poet Laureate. He wrote these words that Unitarian Universalists often use to state our intention and also our aspiration for greater, ever-expanding inclusion. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. This congregation voted in 2004 to make the commitments of a welcoming congregation, welcoming LGBTQ persons and celebrating their lives and relationships as a religious commitment an expression of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And we continue to grow in our understanding of the various ways we as humans are in relation to sex, gender, and orientation. And our growth and knowledge expands that commitment and grows our circle wider. And while we did not have a certification named by our association pointing our way, we have joined our hearts with Unitarian Universalists everywhere to side with the oppressed, to amplify their voices. And those of us who are white learn to step back from directing the effort and to follow the lead of black Americans, indigenous Americans, and people of color in working to dismantle racism and white supremacy because they are the system of inequity 
and that, that still dominates our world. There's so many areas of learning and commitment we would include more fully as we expand the circle and realize that it isn't even ours to keep small, even if that is more comfortable in some moments. And so we kindle the chalice of our hearts this morning with these familiar words. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of freedom. Words of prayer this morning are by Dana Warsnop. Often people say they love being in a congregation with so many like-minded people. I know just what they are getting at, and I know that they aren't getting
getting it quite right. I don't want to be with a bunch of people who just think like me. I want to be in a community where I don't have to think like everyone else to be loved or to be eligible for salvation, however you think of that. I want to be in a congregation with people who value compassion, justice, love, and truth, though they have different thoughts and opinions about all sorts of things. I want to join together with independent-minded people of good heart. I want to be with people who have many names and no name at all for God, or the ultimate. I want to be in community with people who see in me goodness and dignity, who also see my failings and foibles and who still love me. I want to partake in community with people who feel their inner interconnection with all existence and let it guide their footfalls upon the earth. I want to be with people who see life as a paradox and don't always rush to resolve it. I want to become family with people who are willing to walk the tightrope that is life and who will hold my hand as I walk mine. I want this fellowship to be filled with people who let church call them into a different way of being in the world. I want to be in common cause with people in a community who support, encourage, and even challenge each other to higher and more ethical living. I want to be with people who inspire one another to follow the call of the Spirit. I want to share in life with people who covenant to be honest, engaged, and kind, who strive to keep their promises and hold me to the promises I make. I want to be part of a community of people who give of themselves, who share their hearts and minds and gifts. I want to be with people who know that human community is often warm and generous, sometimes challenging, and almost always a grand adventure. In short, I want to be with people like you, May we, virtually or in person, masked and social distanced, learn to be such a community to each other. May we build community not on like-mindedness, but on like-heartedness. May we become a family of vision and action, doing together what we cannot do alone. May we celebrate and value our differences and together work for a future transformed by our care and commitment to love and justice. Amen. Each week as we come together, we have the opportunity to share joys and sorrows from our personal lives, things that affect us deeply, both positively and negatively, so that the community can rejoice with us in our joys and support us in our sorrows. This week, Tom Engel writes, my wife and I are filled with joy that our daughter Miriam gave birth this morning to a baby boy near her home in Colorado. Baby, mother, and father are all doing well. This is our first grandchild. His middle name happens to be Thomas. 
George Thompson writes, My father, who lives in Annapolis and turns 92 in December, asked for a special Father's Day gift back in late March after the shutdown took hold. That his four kids meet him in Stanton for Father's Day, assuming we could. So we all stayed safe and waited for our respective governors to allow for travel. Thankfully, Dad, my brother, and two sisters all made their way safely to our home for a very special Father's Day reunion. We are all grateful that this happened. Let us hold these joys and any joys unspoken or unknown, together with the sorrows that are among us and unspoken today, together in our hearts in a time of silence. I'm Sharon Van Name, and I'd like to share with you a reading from John Daniel titled Dependence Day. It would be a quieter holiday. No fireworks or loud parades. No speeches. No salutes to any flag. A day of staying home instead of crowding away. A day we celebrate nothing gained in war, but what we're given. How the sun's warmth is democratic, touching everyone and the rain is democratic too. How the strongest branches in the wind give themselves as they resist, resist and give themselves. How birds could have no freedom without the planet's weight to wing against. How earth itself could come to be only when a whirling cloud of dust pledged allegiance as a world. Circling dependently around a star and the star blossomed into fire from the ash of other stars. And once, at the dark zero of our time, a blaze of revolutionary light exploded out of nowhere, out of nothing, because nothing needed the light as the brilliance of the light itself needs nothing.
This is Independence Day weekend in the United States, and as I thought about it, a provisional title formed in my mind, the kind of sermon title I might have used before the pandemic swept the schedule of titles and topics away. The title that lingered in the corners of my consciousness was, What is Independence Day to Me? Moments after this title first opened its eyes into my mind, I realized I was leaning on none other than that great ancestor of freedom in America, Frederick Douglass. On July 5th, 1852, in Rochester, New York, Frederick Douglass gave an important speech titled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Douglas started that speech by giving his crowd of gathered Northern white people what they expected in an Independence Day celebration, a recognition of the conditions and merits of the Declaration of Independence and its achievement in that War of Independence against England. But he didn't stay on the praise notes. These are his own words nine years before the onset of the Civil War. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, Lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Harsh words indeed. And it is no secret that the initial promise of independence was for the sole benefit a property owning white men. And what is good in American history since independence has been the result of wars and protests and demonstrations that sometimes succeeded when white America was convinced that the group so favored rightly should include more identities than those originally favored founding fathers. Could that revered group of political ancestors ever have imagined that the people of this powerful land would ever determine it was the only moral option for people who owned no property and women and descendants of enslaved people and indigenous peoples and the people of every ethnicity, race, and color, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, intersex, and other identities on that spectrum of sex, gender, and orientation, that all of these 
should be the legal and social equals of propertied white men? It is a rhetorical question, of course. The Founding Fathers established this country for themselves. Everybody else with varying degrees of oppression served the enrichment and comfort of that small elite group of white male founders. But their hubris and inability or unwillingness to see others of having just as much inherent worth and dignity as they also resulted in an amazing blessing. Many of our founding words that they assumed applied only to them were not so limited in the texts that they produced. And so the American dream of equality for all and later of equity was enshrined in the words of that era's 1%. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among us, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its principles in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Those propertied white men gathered in Philadelphia 244 years ago didn't know they were opening a Pandora's box of equality and right to protest and demand to change. Indeed, the right to overthrow an unjust government. There was a lot that got left out in July of 1776, like slave owner Thomas Jefferson's unironically intended, but oh so ironic condemnation of slavery. But enough remained to work with. The ideas elevated to holy writ in this document, along with other such expressions, gave people of every identity a platform from which to demand change that included them. Frederick Douglass talked of America's unsurpassed brutality. Today we must talk of the unsurpassed brutality of the racist school to prison pipeline, America's highest rate in, of incarceration in all the world, police brutality most greatly resting on the bodies of black people and people of color, voter suppression legislation, the as yet uncorrected injustice of the income gap and the wealth gap that shows ever larger in favor of the 1%. Today, we must talk about the unfinished project of full gender equality. Women and children still bear the brunt of poverty-making policies in this country. Native Americans still do not have control over their own lands and experience some of the worst poverty in the country. LGBTQ people are still not the legal and social equals of our straight siblings. There are so, so many things that cause a person with a conscience to cringe in the way our country operates. There are so many things that need to be changed for justice to come finally and belatedly to America. But the dream of justice is implicit in those unknowing words of our elite and discriminating founders. We hold these truths to be 
self-evident. And so we have something powerful to celebrate even as our eyes are wide open to the extreme moral failings of our political ancestors. Langston Hughes wrote, Oh, yes, I say it plain, and never, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the lands, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. The dream is greater than the founders would have imagined, greater than they would have ever countenanced. The possibilities are infinite to grow the hope of justice and the power to make it so. May we do our part to make the America that is yet to be. Amen and blessed be.